each so be quick if you want to speak to either of them. As I said though today is not the only opportunity to speak to a curator. So uh, just to run and I'll, I'll come back to how the breakout rooms will work once we've heard from everybody else. I don't want to say it all now because I think there's too much time to forget. Um, in terms of what's available, in this round, we are most likely going to make four or five awards of between £1,000 and £1,500 each. In terms of eligibility from the university end, an academic or team of academics needs to apply in collaboration with a curator. To be lead academic, you must be on an academic contract that ends no sooner than your proposed project. And people that don't meet those criteria can be part of a project team, they just can't lead an application. Uh, and your head of school, the head of school of the lead applicant must be supportive of the application. In terms of deadlines, we have extended this year's deadline and it will now be the 17th of April. We're usually pretty quick making decisions, we get it all done within a couple of weeks and projects can start immediately. Um, the sped, spend deadline for this round we've also updated and that will be the end of September 2024. And um, so there's a decent amount of time as well to spend your money should you be awarded a grant. Um, so now, if I can, I'd like to hand over to Yvonne Hardman, uh, who is Head of Collections and Programming at Leeds Museums and Galleries. And Yvonne has got a slideshow to share with you to talk about background to the museum service. Over to you, Yvonne. Thanks, Erica. Hi, everybody. Um, really nice to see so many people here. Um, so I will, oh gosh, I should know how to do this by now, shouldn't I? Um, I'm not, I don't usually use Zoom. Um, sorry, can somebody just uh, tell me how I share, oh, share screen, okay, cool. Can you see that? Yeah, okay, let me start it properly. Okay, lovely. Is that on properly? Somebody nod. Yeah, thanks, Erica. Thanks, Claire. Um, okay, so yes, I'm the head of collections and programs at Leeds Museums and Galleries. Um, we're part of Leeds City Council and we run, um, we run nine venues around the city, which um, you may be familiar with. Um, so Abbey House Museum, Kirkstall Abbey across the road from there, um, Thwaite Water Mill, Leeds Industrial Museum, Leeds City Museum, um, Leeds Art Gallery, and then um, slightly further afield, Temple Newsome and Lotherton Hall. And then also um, the image on the bottom right is um, the collection store at Leeds Discovery Centre, which kind of provides a bit of a hub for um, the service. Um, quite a few curatorial colleagues are based there and um, that's where collections are when they're not at our other sites or on loan elsewhere. Um, so in terms of collections, we um, look after about 1.3 million objects um, for the city. Um, and these are kind of encyclopedic type of collections. So um, spread out everything from archeology span to dress and textiles to fine art. Um, but for this particular round um, of the cross-disciplinary um, fund, we um, have participating colleagues in the areas of natural science, archaeology and numismatics, leads and social history, industrial history, dress and textiles and world cultures. And we also have my colleague Catherine who's working on a project particularly around our sporting collections as well. So in a, shortly you'll hear from um, them to give a little bit more of a flavour of their collection areas um, for you to consider. Um, so in terms of the size of the service, um, we're still rebuilding, I guess, after the pandemic. Um, so in the last financial year, we welcomed about 740,000 people to our venues, which is lower than um, pre-pandemic. Um, so 2019-20, we welcomed about 1.3 million visitors. So we're sort of on the upward trajectory, sort of building back. And I think by this year end, we'll, um, we might not be quite at the, the previous figures, but we, we should have um, exceeded um, the figures from the last financial year. Um, we do a lot of work with um, schools and communities, um, which is really integral to, to what we do. 
And then this is just a flavour of um, some of the previous projects that we have collaborated on through um, this funding. Um, I'm not going to read through them all. And as Erica says, there's um, opportunities to, to see more and hear more about um, other projects. Um, but they really have um, spanned different collection areas and some collaborations that we probably wouldn't think of ourselves, which is the whole point of, of doing this, this programme. Um, so natural science, um, world culture, social history, um, he has an interesting project about music, which can, was connecting to an exhibition that we had coming up, um, dress and textiles, um, the one at the bottom there about um, a first suite of furniture, which is upholstered um, in the picture gallery at Temple Newsome. So really making kind of more unusual connections, I guess, um, with, with different parts of the collections. Um, so as Erica's sort of already outlined, I mean, this really came about from um, the idea of, of wanting to um, sort of share the opportunity and, and put it out there that our collections are there to, to be collaborated um, on and for academics to consider using objects in their research. Um, I think the other aspect is just that, you know, it might be something that leads to a bigger project. So, you know, the fund in itself isn't huge, but, you know, it's that kind of idea of seed funding as well, and maybe it will grow into something, something larger. Um, so the proposals, you know, we're looking for are really to kind of bring um, that mutual benefit, as Erica said, um, they need to work for both the university colleagues and Leeds Museums and Galleries colleagues and definitely have to be um, developed in collaboration from the outset. Um, there may be things around um, public facing activity, um, new interpretation, talks, events, um, but also they don't have to be public facing. They might be um, slightly different, like um, the one I referred to with the furniture at Temple Euston, for example. Um, and where we shared that out, those outcomes through our blog page, for example. Um, and we really want to encourage this to be um, uh, as wide as possible in terms of discipline um, and maybe collect, create, create those collaborations that we, we haven't um, done previously. Um, and then uh, the funding itself can cover those kind of range of things. Um, it, we're, we're not too prescriptive about it. Um, and obviously you know, we recognize it's not a huge amount. So um, open to, to ideas and, and, and you would set that out in your proposal. So I think that's it from me. Um, happy to take any questions or we can do that. Um, whenever Erica, you, you want that. Let's out. hold, let's save those okay. questions. Okay. <laughs> there, there will be some time afterwards, definitely. Okay, thanks a lot, Yvonne. Um, so uh, now it's our opportunity to hear from two colleagues who have previously undertaken a project under the Cross-Disciplinary Innovation Fund, and that is Sapida Kadaraprast and Claire Brown. So I'll hand over to you two. I don't know how you're going to, to run it. Um, let us know if you need anything. <laughs> Hi, thanks very much. Um, could you enable screen saving, screen sharing for me, please? Um, great, thank you very much. Right. Can everybody see that? Is that okay? Brilliant, thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. My name's Claire Brown. I'm the curator of natural science for Leeds Museums and Galleries. And um, I was very fortunate to be working with Sepeda uh, on this project for the last couple of years. I have to confess, I didn't initialize this project. It was nothing to do with me in the beginning. We had an assistant curator of natural science here who was working with Sepeda originally. So um, most of this presentation will be from her because <laughs> Um, I don't know the full ins and outs of it. Um, so this was an application uh, by Sepeda and uh, my colleague Milo Phillips, uh, who worked on it together to um, uh, look at the natural, uh, the insect collections um, at Leeds Museums and Galleries. If I press click, will it move onwards? Yes. 
Great. OK, so the insect collections at Leeds are large and diverse, and they actually include the University of Leeds' um, insect collections. They were transferred to us in 2015. So we have this huge resource, uh, something like 150,000 um, insects in the uh, natural science collection. Um, and uh, we use it for all sorts of different things. And we have researchers coming in looking at it from all sorts of different angles. But I have to confess, I hadn't really come across um, this angle before. So I'm just going to pass over to Sepeda to talk about the rest of the collection. If you want me to move on the uh, re rest of the project, if you want me to move on the screen, just let me know. Sepeda. Yes. Do I have a slide or I think yes. I have? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Sepeda Kodaparas and I'm, a, I'm an academic in a school of mechanical engineering. So if, I think this call for me specifically was like a, a very lucky uh, event because I used to work with museums when I was back in London with Natural History Museum and then with other collaborators for my outreach activities and sort of this call brought the two bits together, which is what's great about the, this uh, working with Leeds museums and galleries because not only you have access to the museums, but you have sort of access to all the activities that they do to reach out to the public. And the project that we had and still sort of ongoing because that uh, we've done part of it and hopefully it's going to continue in the future is around the, the self-cleaning and anti-fouling properties of that, that the wings of certain insects, especially dragonflies and damselflies have. And the idea was most of the, we do have through collaborations with the School of Biology at the University of Leeds, we do have access to uh, different species, but these are mostly collected around UK. So we wanted to have access to species which were collected from different uh, parts of the world. And this is why museum uh, uh, collections are very useful. They were collected at different points of time and different uh, locations. So we did collect some uh, samples from the museum and still currently working on them. But the idea was to, to first of all, to be able to characterize them at, across different scales. So these wings, at the, at, if you put them on the microscope, they look quite smooth. But if you put them under an electron microscope, you see all these uh, levels of roughness that, that, that appear. And these are typically nanoscale, so much smaller than, uh, thousands of times smaller than a human hair. And uh, pillars, which are formed on the, on the, on the wings of the insects, the outer side of the wings of the insects. And they have uh, specific, the, the properties they have that we are at least interested in is how they handle fluids, that they have these non-wetting properties. So if any kind of fluid, if you drop any kind of fluid on the, on the surface of the wings, it doesn't wet the surface, which is really good for the insects so they don't get wet wings and it stays functional. But at the same time, we are also looking at the, uh, the effect of that these kind of nanostructures have on contamination. So anything from uh, particles, dust contamination, or anything that is typically brought by fluids and, and liquid to the surface, such as even bacterial contamination. So we have done uh, some characterization on some of the things that we collected. Have already run uh, one outreach activity with the with the, the Discovery Center and the, the Leeds Museums and Galleries, and hopefully we will have another, uh, I believe, outreach activity set up for for March. So I'm really looking forward, to it and I'm hoping that it's it's not going to end here, and we continue working together. And uh, Claire and um, even have been nice enough also to support another application that we had on on a similar topic for uh, for a research council, and they supported part of the the application with uh, at least supporting us for the especially the outreach program, and again supporting us with uh, with samples uh, that we can collect at the discovery center. And the image on the right is an image that one of the colleagues took at one of the, the outreach programs that we had, which was quite a pleasant. Event and I think it in term, from the university side of things, it's this is really valuable because the museums they have really this beautiful access to beautiful spaces and this good link with the public. So the more we can is is, is a fantastic opportunity for people like myself at the university to bring what we do out uh, research to the public and talk about it to children and members of the public. So. Yeah, just to add to that, um, we do a lot of outreach with schools and although Sepeda couldn't manage the, um, the school sessions that we were going to run with her 
particularly on this one. Um, it was just a clash of diary dates. We were very, very happy for her to come in with um, more further learning, you know, to add to our offer when we went into schools. Um, but I know that you're coming to a, a science fair that we're doing in March. Um, and we have lots of, well, a huge variety of uh, different outreach programs that we that we involved in constantly. So that's a, from our point of view, it's an additional offer from, you know, the museum collection side, but it's also very nice to have academics uh, in front of school children as well. So we really, really value that. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks very much, both of you. Um, Claire, it was really great to hear you reflect on the impact of, of working in this collaborative way uh, for the museums. And Sepida, I just wondered if you would mind um, elaborating a little bit on the impact that this work has had on your own research. You mentioned that you've applied for another couple of grants off the back of this. I just wondered if you could tell colleagues a bit more about that so they hear about your experience of working in this way to enhance research. Shall I? Okay. So, I mean, I had a, a grant application which was basically on the on this functionality of insect wings and how we can replicate it uh, by engineering tools to create similar patterns and how we can use this functionality to to build antibacterial materials. And uh, just because we already had this uh, link with the with the Leeds museums and galleries, the idea that we put in there was. To, to first of all be able to, to get some more samples and access to the to the collections at the museum, but also be able to, to continue our outreach activities, which is quite important to most of the, the funders. And, uh, and also hopefully if we get these kind of fundings, uh, to, to be able to create also some visual uh, art, out of what we have done in, in science and bring it back to the museum. So just to pay back what we have <laughs> received from the museum. Yeah. That's perfect. Thanks very much. Thanks both of you for your time today. Um, so uh, now on to the opportunity for colleagues here from the university to talk to a curator. Um, how we'll tell you when your slot is. Uh, so, Rebecca has got ready to go a, uh, a timeline. This is where all the technical stuff kicks in. So cross your fingers um, of breakout rooms, one per curator. So shortly she will move the curators into their own uh, breakout spaces to take appointments, <laughs> to take appointments with, uh, with colleagues. Um, and she, Rebecca will post when your time slot is with your chosen uh, curator. If your time slot is not the curator's first slot, if it's their second, third or fourth of the session, please stay in this Zoom meeting. Um, feel free, obviously, to mute yourself, turn your camera off and get on with some other work until it, until your time has come. Um, and, uh, and Rebecca will move you into your breakout room at the allotted time. Uh, here in the main Zoom room, uh, I will stay with my colleagues, Rebecca and Yasmin, and Yvonne will be here too. If you've got any questions generally about um, museums and galleries collections, or if you have any questions about the scheme, feel free to stay and ask us. Uh, once you have had your appointment with your curator, feel free to leave the meeting. There's no plenary session to come back for. Um, we will be in touch with you, as I explained at the beginning, via email after the session with the recording and all of the application materials. Um, but th there's uh, there's nothing more to, to stay in the meeting for. Um, Erica, yes. sorry to interrupt. Are we just going to do a quick round robin of curators just to introduce their... Oh, uh, we are. I've missed first. that. Sorry, I have missed that section. Yes, it is we now. We can be your... brief. <laughs> yes, of course. No, I've, I've, I've moved my screen on too far and I've missed that section. So yes, um, Yvonne is going to lead that bit. That's, I've just skipped onto my next section. That's why it's all about me. Um, if, I can, if I can ask Yvonne to introduce the curators in turn and they are going to give a little introduction to their uh, collections. Okay. Thank you, Erica. Um, so we're going to hear again from Claire, actually, to start with. Um, so a bit more of a, a broader overview of natural science. Uh, hello, everyone, 
Hello again, everybody. I've just got a quick PowerPoint. Right, very, very quickly. So the science, uh, the, um, the natural science collection at Leeds has about 800,000 um, specimens, specimens in it. Um, we have collections from all, of the, all over the world. We've been collecting for 200 years. Um, those are a few of the areas of the collection. We are a designated uh, collection, which means we are nationally identified as an important and culturally valuable collection. Uh, we have extraordinary um, objects like a lot of extinct um, species, so Carolina Carolina parakeets, dodos, thylacines. Uh, this is grandmother panda, not extinct yet, um, who uh, is, was the first panda ever to arrive in the UK. Um, in 1938, Tilbury Docks. We have large um, crazy taxidermy like uh, tigers. We have a big customs and excise collection, so things that were collected at docks around the country. Um, we also have cultural history associated with our objects. So this is Mock the Gorilla, who was a um, 1930s London Zoo gorilla who was illustrated by Stuart Trezellian, who illustrated the Rudyard Kipling book. So he took sketches of um, zoo animals at the time, and we have that in the uh, we have the sketch of Mock at the, in the collections at the moment. Um, so just thinking more widely beyond just the biology. We also have a really large collection of uh, plants, about 250,000 um, specimens, including the University of Leeds' specimens that came to us in 2015. Um, and we also have a small type collection, so um, type specimens, uh, mainly in the mollusk collection. Um, those are my details, and I've tried to be quick. There we go. Uh, thank you, Claire. Um, next, we're going to hear from Kat Baxter, who's our Curator of Archaeology and Numismatics. Hi everyone, I'm Kat. Um, as Ron said, I'm the curator of archaeology and numismatics, archaeology and numismatics, which is basically old things and sh round shiny things, to put it in brief. Um, the archaeology collection is, I always say, around 30,000 objects, but I think that's a massive underestimation. Um, the core of the collection, like Claire said, you know, the archaeology was starting to be collected 200 years ago with the Leeds Philosophical Literary Society. And the core of the collection is really what they were interested in collecting. So we have quite a broad collection of Egyptology, which will come as no surprise, um, as well as objects from across Egypt. We have um, a really nice collection of objects from sites across uh, the ancient Roman Empire, ancient Greece and Cyprus, and smaller collections like Jericho, where we're particularly strong in um, like Bronze Age ceramics. Um, the sort of highlight of our overseas collection, or what people talk about the most, I, I guess, um, the most famous display is that of Nessie Amun, who was a priest who lived 3,000 years ago in Egypt, and whose mummified remains are on display in the city museum. Uh, there's a lot of archaeology closer to home as well. We have archaeology from across Europe, where we're particularly strong in prehistory and lithics. Uh, collecting today is very much focused on leads and has been for some time. So. The majority of what we acquire is from um, excavations within the boundaries of Leeds Metropolitan District and other sources of finds come from accidental finds, metal detectorists and things like that, but usually with a Leeds focus. I should also obviously mention Kirk Salabi, which is arguably our largest archaeological object. So not only do Leeds Museums and Galleries look after the site of this 12th century um, monastery, we also have a, a huge archive of medieval objects from excavations um, over the years at this site. We also um, look after paleo-environmental archives where we can look at past environments. We have a sizable collection of human remains as well, which um, obviously we're extra, we have you know, extra sensitivities about in terms of how they're accessed and used and we're always considerate of the ethical issues surrounding these collections as well. So it, it's quite difficult to summarise the contents of the archaeology collection. It's so broad. We have everything from, um, you know, life-size marble Roman statues to tiny, like, mesolithic blades from, from Europe. So anything you're interested in archaeological, I'd say there's quite a, a large chance we'll have an example of it in the collection. Um, numismatics, as well, is another collection which is sort of interlinked to archaeology, probably around 30,000 objects. Same kind of collecting history. Um, a lot of Greek and Roman coinage, but we've been actively collecting modern coinage and particularly trying to collect around changes in spending practices, particularly cashlessness. We had a major exhibition on money last year at the City Museum where we explored some of these themes.
themes. So we're quite strong on coin hoards that have been found around Leeds and, and across the country. Um, we've got a lot of commemorative medals, tokens, banknotes, seals and um, military medals as well. So in terms of my sort of future priorities for the collection, I think, I mean, there's always a lot of things going on that we're looking at at the same time, but certainly sort of decolonization of collections, trying to tell fuller stories of the collections that we have, increasing representation, telling stories of those who've maybe traditionally been overlooked in the past is an area that we're particularly looking at. Um, I would say Kirk Salabi is an area we're particularly looking at trying to enhance the visitor experience there and um, investigating death, dying and bereavement through time more generally because we're doing an exhibition looking at death and dying in 2024. So that's an area I'm particularly interested in. But to be honest, anything you're interested in, please just drop me a line. Lovely, thanks Kat. Um, next up we're going to hear from Kitty, who is the Curator of Leeds and Social History. Thanks Kitty. Hello again, <clears throat> I'm going to share my screen, um, if I can find the... I'm just trying to find the... Bear with me, oops. Sorry, I've managed to... Bear with me. I, as I said, I also find my collection very difficult to um, summarise because it is um, Leeds social his and uh, social history collections. Um, we've really been collecting that mainly for about two hundred years, um, like what one hundred years out of the two hundred years, because it's really from the twentieth century that they started museums started being interested in sort of changes um, more closer to home rather than looking outwards. Um, I think I've got too many windows up, which is my problem. And I've lost the bit that I'm trying to focus on. Um, You're still sharing the- I know, I'm just, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to actually find the bit to, um, I've I managed to click on something. You're on mute as well now. just vanished from me and I'm just trying to get it to go, uh... Do you want us to come back to you, Kitty? Yeah, it would be actually, because I just, um, I think I'll just stop share and if so... Actually, if I just share again, I probably managed to do it. Um... Right, that's think that's that's this should work now. <laughs> so basically, I've just thrown in a f just in order to just give us brief idea of the sort of things I collect um, for Leeds, um, Leeds history and social history. This is just a snapshot of some of the things that we acquired last year. So it includes um, so lots of contemporary collecting. Um, I won't go much, too much into the sports collecting because that's my colleague Catherine Robbins has been working on that. But we have an exhibition, our current exhibition, Abbey House is called All to Play For and is um, looking at sport and play in Leeds. Um, but all sorts of things just come in. We have acquired quite a lot of sort of um, military collections recently, including these two photographs, which are from a, a Royal Flying Corps um, pilot from um, who was uh, active in 1916 to 18, uh, who was from Leeds, and we've got a massive photographic archives that we're really trying to explore there. Um, the doll is from um, somebody who was a, a Polish um, immigrant to Leeds in the early 19, um, 1920s and um, very active in the Polish community in Leeds, and this is a doll in Polish costume. Um, the board game is uh, part of our Waddington's collection, but was also acquired as part of a collaboration with actually a colleague from your rival uh, institution from Leeds Beckett, uh, looking at Waddington's games. Um, we acquired uh, a collection from an excessive collector of um, Crested China that we managed to buy and is on display at Leeds City, um, Leeds City Museum um, at the moment. Um, we'll do 
all sorts of our, working with our community team there's a lot of sort of proactive um or and sometimes responsive contemporary collecting so i think the um environmental placard there was just left on the uh, doorstep of uh, Leeds city museums after one of the um recent um climate strike protests um and then if i just take you on to the next one and these are again just things i've been very recently dealing with uh, and recent acquisitions so we have a a beer can from a um Northern Monk Brewery in Leeds, which uh, was associated with sort of um, uh, Olya Hope, he leads Ukrainian um, chef, who I sort of just saw on, on Twitter and sort of said, could we get hold of that? Um, we've acquired quite a lot of material around the recent unveiling of the plaque for David Oluwali with the Leeds Civic Trust. And this example is actually the temporary um, replacement that was put up um, and then torn down after the original was shockingly stolen. So we, as I said, that's a bit of, again, very sort of reactive um, collecting. And that's in the Overlooked exhibition, which is about to open at City Museum. Um, and um, the little dog collar is just illustration sort of things that my colleagues asked me. So um, Lotharton Hall is just doing an exhibition, a little display around dogs. So um, asking what we had already in our collections. So it just shows that we have collections in almost every area. So just again, like um, and Claire said, to just ask and we might have it. Um, and I'm open to sort of working on any, any of those things. And I'll stop there. Great, thanks Kitty. Um, and Catherine's gonna come in now and just pick up on the particular strand around uh, sports that we're doing at the moment. Uh, hi, uh, so yeah, I'm Catherine. I'm uh, one of the project curators, me and Lucy Raw Jobshare, um, and we are working on a project um, around sport in Leeds, focusing on our sport collection. So we're working on it starting last January and going hopefully into next April. Um, the overall purpose of the project was kind of to increase the representation of sports in our collections. So of the collections of these museums and galleries, about 2000 objects are related to sport. Um, there's kind of some particular areas which have higher representation. So uh, there's a lot of rugby and football cards from kind of the end of the 1800s to the early 1900s. Um, there's some representation of like older games such as Nair and Spell and some uh, older bowling balls. Um, colleagues previously have done some contemporary collecting projects. So there's bits and pieces from the 2012 Olympics, um, such as a wheel guard for a wheelchair rugby uh, chair um, from the Canadian rugby team. Um, there was a project on around women in sport in uh, about 2012 as well. Um, and yeah, our, our work is kind of focused on trying to collect more objects and understand the existing collections a bit better as well. Um, because a lot of the objects, particularly the kind of ones which have been in the collection for a long time, um, don't have a great deal of context with them. So um, we have a research, a, a volunteer research group who have been doing some work around those objects and Lucy and I have done a little bit as well. So, uh, for example, uh, there is a blog online which explains it slightly better, but Lucy's just been doing some work around um, a football factory that was based down in Lady Lane and that was just sparked off by, I think, a photograph that we had in our collection. Um, and going into the next year, we're hoping to focus um, kind of a combination of outreach. So. Um, the volunteers I've been working with, we developed an outreach box of objects. So I want to take those out to places um, such as like rugby games and shopping centres to talk to people and learn more about the objects, but also looking at digital collecting, um, specifically uh, kind of creating films and all histories to add that context to objects that you might not get from physical objects, but also collect around like the less tangible um sports that you get across the city like people playing basketball in the park people cycling along the canal um so yeah there, there's there's a lot of different types of objects lots of different ways to get into it but that's kind of a summary of it great thanks Catherine um next up we're going to hear from John John McGoldrick who's our curator of industrial history 
Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, uh, indus industrial, it's quite a loaded term and it comes with lots of uh, baggage and preconceptions. Um, the collections are, like uh, colleagues, so vast, it kind of keeps me awake at night, just kind of trying to kind of keep my, my head around them. Um, we cover uh, a vast range of topics. Uh, textiles, for example, is one uh, of those that we, we cover. Uh, I've got an object here, um, which kind of hopefully you can see, um, which sort of gives you a bit of the, an idea of the broad range. So this is something that was used in the late 1700s uh, for combing wool and woven wool products called the teasel. Uh, well, the collections go right through to the, the 20th century uh, and include uh, a computer the size of two wardrobes called a Solartron machine, which was used by Burton's, the, uh, the well-known um, clothing department store, to, uh, to scan uh, receipts from all the branches to, so they could actually collate and, and kind of more efficiently manage their, uh, their, their receipts and, and income. So um, with collections covering uh, themes such as forces, um, if you're interested in measuring, we've got machines that can tell you how hard you could hit things. Uh, we've got great optic collections uh, representing Kershaw's, who were a Leeds company who made uh, microscopes, they made uh, cameras that went to the South Pole. Um, they, we have uh, objects representing the human impact of industrialization. We did a really uh, interesting exhibition with the British Library recently uh, called Living with Machines. We've got railway objects that uh, Henry Ford tried to buy from Leeds uh, and we told him to, to bog off, thankfully. Um, and we were also starting to do an exhibition uh, called Engineering, uh, which is inspired by uh, Smeaton Speed, 300, which is one of the Leeds 2023 uh, major projects. And um, tried to explore the kind of legacy of John Smeaton, uh, termed himself, himself a civil engineer. He was the first person to do that. In fact, he also came up with this term engineering, which was a kind of represented how they were all kind of working in the dark and, uh, you know, not working with the certainties that, that engineers today kind of work with. So uh, we'd be really interested in talking to, to engineers or people who are just in, interested in engineering for, from whatever angle you, you happen to come from, uh, from your particular discipline. So we'd be really, I'd certainly really interested to, to talk to people uh, about that as well. Thanks, and, John. Great, thank you. Um, next up we have Natalie Waugh, who's our Curator of Dress and Textiles. Um, hello everybody. Um, yeah, so the Dress and Textiles collection, um, again we have about, like I say, about 20,000 objects, but like everybody we never really fully know. But in this collection we have items of clothing, accessories and um, other related material, which all reflect um, the history of British fashion, so we deal with the British side of it. Um, Items in the collection date from about the beginning of the 18th century. We do have a few accessories which are a bit earlier, but dress just tends not to survive so well um, from that age um, any earlier. But we collect right up to modern day. So we've just recently um, had a bit of a shopping trip out in Salides, with, um, which was part of a project working with young people where we acquired just some high street bits and pieces. Um, so the collection showcases both high-end fashion but also everyday clothing. Um, particular strengths in the collection include our 18th century um, collection, which is both men's and women's fashion. Um, and a lot of this all came from one collector um, who was a Leeds-based man, um, and it came to us back in the 1940s. A bit like Kitty's social history collection, um, Dress and textile collections tend to be not as old as kind of natural science and archaeology. It's kind of in, in the world of museums, it's a bit of a modern um, conception looking at these kind of things. Um, we also have a large collection of underwear and foundation garments for things like um, days, corsets, crinolines, um, and it's quite a comprehensive collection as well. Um, for everyday clothing, we do tend to um, have more of a focus on clothes um, either worn or manufactured in this region, so Leeds and kind of the wider Yorkshire area. Um, and in this, where um, we cross over then with John's collection, the industrial history collection, we have a large tailoring collection, which is related to the Leeds tailoring industry, who were very much making suits, kind of mid-range suits. So from the big high street names such as Burton's and Hepworth, who were both manufacturing in Leeds, um, but also then had their shop across the country basically. Um, the textile collection, um, this bit of the collection, we have lots of fragments of textiles and um, so yeah they may be just tiny bits and pieces but they show the wide variety of techniques used in the production of textiles for European 
kind of dress furnishings and kind of used in interiors, home interiors. Um, for this collection, we have um, again two um, kind of uh, collections which came from two collectors, Henry Ginsberg and Roger Warner. Um, and it, within these, we have kind of examples of woven silks, printed linens, uh, cottons, embroideries. And these, the textile fragments do date a bit earlier from sort of the 15th century onwards. Um, and some of the pieces we have in that collection are kind of quite rare. Um, and then we also have more recent acquisitions include um, things like a collection of lace, um, but also an archive of pattern designs by a designer called Sheila Bonus, who was a freelance pattern designer based in Yorkshire, working in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. So we just have her designs for that. Um, the kind of projects I'm working on at the moment is I'm doing lots of planning for an ex exhibition about children's clothing, um, but we're also keen to do more stuff with our textiles in particular, um, and looking at things like even just um, kind of analysis of fibres and dyes, etc. the kind of things we're starting to look at a bit more. Um, but yeah, it'd be good to chat to people with ideas and what they'd like to do with the collection. Be great. Thanks, Natalie. Um, we don't seem to have Adam um, join us yet. So um, I think I will try and give him a call um, in a moment and um, hopefully he can come for his slots. Um, but maybe Eric, or if we can just move on, if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Thanks very much to all of you. Um, and now back to the schedule. I think I'm now in the right place. Uh, sorry to have panicked everybody, mostly Rebecca, um, uh, for my earlier mistake with the schedule. So uh, now it is your opportunity to talk to a curator. As I mentioned before, they've got four slots each. Um, Claire and Adam are now fully booked and there is availability with some of the other uh, curators. So um, while we wait to see if Yvonne can talk to Adam and just get him into the call, um, I'll just explain how or recap how this is going to work. So what we'll do is um, put you into your breakout space with your chosen curator at the time allotted. So um, obviously it depends what time we start, but if we start say just before one, then Rebecca will on a 10 minute schedule she will spot people around uh, so you should know roughly what time you are due to be put into your breakout space um, if you don't have the first appointment with the curator as I said you can by all means uh, come and ask any questions or make any points of clarification with myself and the Cultural Institute team and Yvonne in the main space of the Zoom meeting or feel free to to do something else in the background and, until your slot comes up um, if you uh, don't want to talk to a curator today, if you're not at the point of uh, readiness with a, an idea, that's absolutely fine. Um, as I said, the closing date will now be the 17th of April. So there is time later on to make contact outside of this meeting uh, with somebody uh, further down the line once you've had time to formulate some ideas uh, in a bit more detail. Uh, once you've had your appointment, feel free to leave. Um, there's no plenary session to come back for. Okay, so if I can just check back in with Yvonne, oh, I can't see her on the screen, is she? Let me just see what's going on. Has she gone? Yeah. She's left the meeting, okay. No worries. Right. In that case, I think the best thing for us to do is to crack on with the appointments. Um, I, I need to say to everybody, thanks very much for coming today. Thank you for your time, your interest in the in the uh, fund. If you would like any further details on any of the things that we've mentioned today, then please feel free to contact me outside of this meeting and we'll be in touch with you shortly uh, with the recording. Um, if you are interested in keeping up to date with the work of the Culture Institute, the best way to do that is by signing up to our newsletter and yes, we will drop the link for that in the chat now. So, uh, Rebecca, if I can ask you to open the room.